Right. That ends Northern Ireland questions. We are now coming to questions to the Prime Minister. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagements question, and then we will call Kim Johnson. So, Prime Minister, your engagement. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It will be three years tomorrow since a chemical weapon was deployed by Russian military intelligence on the streets of Salisbury. All our thoughts remain with those affected, their families and loved ones, and we will continue to seek justice for them. Mr Speaker, I'm sure this House will want to pay tribute to the people of Salisbury and Amesbury and wish them well for the future. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. I said to Kim Johnson. Kim. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Liverpool is a welcoming city, the oldest Chinese community in Europe. But in 1946, the British government ordered the forced repatriation of thousands of Chinese seamen living in Liverpool with their British families back to China, causing lasting emotional trauma. Many of those descendants still live in my Liverpool Riverside constituency. Will the Prime Minister take steps to acknowledge these events and provide the descendants with a formal apology and for the justice they deserve? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Speaker, I have happy memories of my own uh, visits uh, to Liverpool, and I can tell her that uh, I, I can tell her that uh, we are certainly very grateful across the country to the uh, Chinese community for their amazing uh, contribution, and her message has been heard loud and clear. Right. Let's head to John Stevenson. John. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Pirelli factory in Carlisle employs around 800 people contributes hundreds of millions of pounds to the local economy and is an exporter. Its location is a consequence of regional economic policy from 50 years ago. Would the Prime Minister agree that if we are to rebalance the economy, level up the country, we need a modern day proactive regional economic policy? And if he does agree, will he come to Carlisle to see the old and new in action? Uh, of course, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for, uh, for what he says, and uh, he will hear uh, more in just uh, half an hour or so. Let's try and uh, keep it to half an hour, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, 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 from the Chancellor, about how exactly we intend to make sure we build back better across the whole of this country and, and, and unleash the tremendous uh, potential of the whole of the United Kingdom, including, uh, of course, Carlisle, which he so well represents. The Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the Salisbury atrocity? Um, does the Prime Minister agree with President Biden that the sale of arms that could be used in the war in Yemen should be suspended? Prime uh, Mr Speaker, ever since the uh, tragic conflict in uh, Yemen broke out, this country has scrupulously followed the uh, consolidated guidance of which uh, uh, he will be well aware. Yes, the trouble is that whilst President Biden has suspended arms sales that could be used in Yemen, the UK hasn't. In fact, we sold £1.4 billion of arms to Saudi Arabia in, the last, in three months last year, including bombs and missiles that could be used in Yemen. Given everything we know about the appalling humanitarian cost of this war, with innocent civilians caught between the Saudi coalition and the Houthi rebels, why does the Prime Minister think it's right? to be selling these weapons? Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK is part of a, an international uh, coalition following the uh, UN resolutions, which uh, uh, he will know well, uh, which uh, are uh, very clear that the legitimate government of uh, Yemen was uh, removed uh, illegally. Uh, those are the resolutions that we we follow and we continue scrupulously to follow uh, the humanitarian guidance, which are amongst the toughest measures anywhere in the world in respect of all arms sales. He talks about uh, humanitarian relief, Mr Speaker, and actually I think the people of this country can be hugely proud of what we are doing to support the people of Yemen. Uh, almost £1 billion of aid contributed uh, in the last five years, Mr Speaker. Yes, Mr Speaker, he says the system is very robust in relation to arms sales. It can't be that robust. The government lost a court case just two years ago in relation to arms sales. The truth is the UK is increasingly isolated in selling arms to Saudi Arabia, despite what's happening in Yemen, despite Saudi Arabia's human rights record, and the brutal murder 
of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. A murder the US has concluded was approved by the Saudi Crown Prince. So I have to ask, what will it take for the Prime Minister to suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia? Speaker, uh, we could uh, condemn the murder of Jamal uh, Khashoggi. We continue to call uh, for a full invest investigation into the causes of his death. And indeed, uh, we have already sanctioned 20 people, uh, Mr Speaker, in Saudi Arabia. And I repeat the, the point that I have made, that the UK government continues to follow the consolidated guidance, uh, which, by the way, Mr Speaker, was set up by the Labour Party. Mr Speaker, to make matters worse, the government decided this week to halve international aid to Yemen. Halve it. The UN has said that Yemen faces the worst famine the world has seen for decades. And the Secretary General said on Monday that cutting aid would be, in his words, a death sentence for the people of Yemen. How on earth can the Prime Minister justify selling arms to Saudi Arabia and cutting aid to people starving in Yemen? Mr Speaker, it is under this government that we have increased uh, aid spending uh, to the highest proportion uh, in uh, the history of, of our country. And yes, uh, it is true that current uh, straightened circumstances, which I'm sure the people of this country understand, mean that temporarily we must uh, reduce uh, aid spending. But that does not obscure the fact, Mr Speaker, that when it comes to our duty to the people of Yemen, we continue to step up to the plate. Uh, a, a contribution of £214 million uh, for this financial year. There are very few other countries in the world, Mr Speaker, that have such a record, that are setting such an example in spending and supporting uh, the people of Yemen. This week, the Government halved our international aid to Yemen. If, the, if this is what the Prime Minister thinks global Britain should look like, he should think again. And if he doesn't believe me, doesn't like it from me or the UN Secretary General, he should listen to his own MPs. Just this morning, the Conservative MP for Bournemouth East said, cutting support to starving children is not what global Britain should be about. It undermines the very idea of the UK as a nation to be respected on the global stage. And the Honourable Member for Sutton Coalfield said this, this was unconscionable. Will the Prime Minister now do the right thing and reconsider this urgently? Uh, Mr Speaker, I repeat, we've given a billion pounds since the conflict began. We're in support of, of UN resolutions. This year, we're contributing another £214 million pounds to support the people of, of Yemen. There are very few other countries in the world, Mr Speaker, that have that kind of record. I think in these tough straightened circumstances, uh, bearing in mind the immense cost of the COVID epidemic that has affected our country, I think the people of this country should be very, very proud of what we are doing. Yes, Mr Speaker, Britain should be a moral force for good in the world. But just as the US is stepping up, the UK is stepping back. If the Prime Minister and Chancellor are so determined to press ahead with their manifesto-breaking cuts to international aid, cutting the budget to 0.5%, they should at least put that to a vote in this House. Will he have the courage to do so? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we are going to get on with our agenda of delivering for the people of this country and spending more than virtually any other country in the world. By the way, spending more still than virtually any other country in the G7 on aid. It's a record, I think, of which this country can be proud. Given the difficulties that this country faces, Mr Speaker, I think that the people of this country will think that we've got our priorities right. He can't work out, Mr Speaker, what his priorities are. One minute uh, he's backing uh, us on the roadmap. The next week he's turning his back on us. Uh, one, one week, well, uh, he can't even be, he can't, he can't even address a question on the issues of the hour. He's going to have a, he's, he, he could have asked anything about the coronavirus pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Instead, he's consecrated his questions, uh, he's consecrated questions entirely to the interests of the people of Yemen, Mr. Speaker. We are, and, and we are doing everything we can to support the people of, of Yemen, given the constraints that we face. We're getting on, Mr. Speaker, with a cautious but irreversible roadmap to freedom, which I hope that he will support. And very shortly, Mr. Speaker, you will be hearing a budget for recovery. I think I already know most of it. Dr Liam Fox. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will be aware that when devolution was established in Scotland, there was no separate Scottish civil service created. 
We have a UK civil service with UK ministerial oversight. Yeah, yeah. Given the turmoil in Scottish politics, will he then confirm that any civil servants who feel pressurised to behave inappropriately have a mechanism to seek redress beyond the ministers to whom they are immediately answerable? Uh, of course, uh, thank my right honourable friend. Of course, we will uh, support all uh, civil servants. And by the way, I thank them for their work up and down uh, the country uh, that they've done uh, throughout the, uh, the pandemic. And I think uh, everybody in this House would agree that now is the time, uh, really, for our civil service to focus uh, on working together uh, to build back together, uh, rather than build back better together, rather than on measures that might divide our country, Mr Speaker. Now comes the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the terrible atrocity three years ago in the town of Salisbury? Mr Speaker, the situation in Yemen has been called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 100,000 people have been killed. 16.2 million are at risk of starvation. 2.3 million children, Prime Minister, are at death's door, facing acute malnutrition. The UK Government's response isn't one of compassion. Instead, it is to impose cuts. That's what you're doing, Prime Minister. A 50% cut to international aid to Yemen <laughs> a move that the UN Chief Antonio Guterres has described as a death sentence. Since the start of the war, the Tories have shamefully backed the Saudi regime through billions of pounds of arms sales and support, despite evidence of war crimes and of the targeting of civilians. Will the Prime Minister confirm that today's budget will force through the devastating cuts to international aid? Yeah, yeah. Speaker, I think anybody listening to this uh, debate uh, will have heard me say that this country, this government, uh, in the last five years has given £1 billion to support the people of Yemen. I can tell him that on Monday, Mr Speaker, in case he thinks there's any uh, diminution of our efforts, on Monday we're going to provide cash support to 1.5 million of the most vulnerable uh, Yemeni households, support 400 health clinics and treat 75,000 cases of severe malnutrition, Mr Speaker. That is the continuing effort of the British people and the British government to help the people of Yemen. In Blackford. The reality, Mr Speaker, is a 50% cut to Yemen aid at a time of a global pandemic. The coronavirus has hit poor and vulnerable countries the hardest, threatening decades of hard-won gains whilst exacerbating existing inequalities. During his leadership race, the Prime Minister made a commitment to stand by 0.7% for aid spending, a position he reaffirmed in June last year at that very dispatch box. What followed was yet another U-turn, another broken promise. Why is the Prime Minister breaking his own manifesto commitment, and why are his government breaking the promises they made to the world's poorest? Here, here. Mr Speaker, I think most people in this country will know that the government has given uh, £280 billion pounds uh, to support the people, uh, the economy, the livelihoods, the businesses, up and down the whole of the United Kingdom. And that, has, uh, as you will hear from the Chancellor, Mr Speaker, has placed uh, strains on our public finances. Meantime, we continue to do everything we possibly can to support the people of Yemen, including, by the way, through a massive vaccination programme to which the people of this country have contributed £548 million, pounds, the second biggest contributor in the world, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will know from his time working in the black country how important our green spaces and green belt are. Will he make sure that Dudley Council and our Mayor Andy Street have the powers and the resources they need to ensure development is on ground field rather than valuable green spaces and make sure that local people's voices are clearly heard and taken into account, including where the proposed development is across local authority borders, like in the surrounding Greenbelt to Dudley Centre. Indeed, Mr Speaker, we will protect our green belt, uh, our, our vital green belt, and, uh, which constitutes, I think, 12.4 per cent of our, of our land. Uh, but we can build our homes, as my, right, uh, my own friend rightly suggests, uh, 300,000 of them on brownfield sites across the country. Let's head to Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Sir Geoffrey. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are now into the third month of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and we're fast approaching the end of the uh, three-month grace period. And the Prime Minister will be aware of the disruption that the protocol is causing uh, to trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the damage it's doing to the stability of the political institutions established under the Belfast Agreement. What action does the Prime Minister intend to take to deliver on his promise that he would protect Northern Ireland's position within the UK internal market and provide us with unfettered access to goods from Great Britain? Uh, Mr Speaker, the position of, U of Northern Ireland within the UK internal market is uh, rock solid and guaranteed. Uh, we are making sure uh, that we underscore that with some temporary operational uh, easings uh, in order to protect uh, the uh, uh, protect the market in some areas, uh, such as food supplies, uh, pending further discussions with the EU. And I, as I've said, I think to the right honourable to the right honourable gentleman uh, and his colleagues, uh, we leave nothing off the table in order to ensure that we get this right. Mr Speaker, our British vaccine finished in Wockhart in Wrexham has shown the globe exactly what the UK can achieve. In Wrexham we have the Myla Hospital, College Cambria, Glendore University and an industrial estate bristling with SMEs. We're close to the Midlands and the North West. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that now is the time for our young people to look at careers and aspire to careers in STEM and healthcare, and Wrexham is the hub that can take us forward? Yeah. My honourable friend is completely right. I thank her, by the way, again for her amazing service in the, uh, in the NHS. Uh, in, in Wrexham and her returning to the, to the front line. And actually, it was in Wrexham at Wockhart uh, that I met a young female scientist, Mr Speaker, who are helping to make the, the vaccine that is not only going to free our country, we hope, uh, from the captivity of COVID, but help to liberate the entire world. It was wonderful to see it happening in Wrexham. We want to see many more young female scientists growing up in that part of the world. Let's head to Graham Morris. Graham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to ask about an important domestic issue. The system of the property tax in England is broken. Council tax places an unfair burden on people living in the poorest communities without generating the revenues needed to fund local services. So does the Prime Minister agree that a proportional property tax, as proposed by the Fair Share campaign, would create a transparent property taxation system generate revenues local government needs and ease the tax burden on hard-pressed families across the country, including in my constituency of Easington. Uh, Mr Speaker, with great respect to the Honourable Member, what the uh, country needs are councillors that uh, charge you less while delivering better services. And if you look across the country, you can see that it's overwhelmingly Conservative-run uh, councils uh, that, that do that, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I, I, the uh, right honourable gentleman after, opposite laughs and Mr. Bigger, uh, Westminster, they kept council taxes low. Uh, in Camden, uh, where he lives, it's three times as high. That's the difference, uh, Mr. Speaker. Sir David Evans. Last Friday, my constituent, Mr. Luke Belfield, who was aged just 18, was stabbed to death just a few miles from his family home. This has been horrendous for his family and his friends who have been left behind, and my heart goes out to them all. What more does my right honourable friend think that the police, society and parliament can do to make sure that there never will in the future be such senseless murders again? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I sympathise very much with uh, Luke's family and his friends and uh, there's nothing I can say to, 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 to uh, alleviate their loss. Uh, but what we are doing, Mr Speaker, is uh, recruiting many more police officers to fight crime, uh, rolling up the county lines, uh, drugs, gangs, uh, wherever we can, and setting out plans to keep serious sexual and violent offenders uh, behind bars for longer. And I, I, I can tell the House uh, that we've now got 6,620 of our target uh, extra 20,000 police already recruited. Patrick Grady. Mr Speaker, we know that the Prime Minister is the proud leader of a British nationalist party, and he says that his no to another independence referendum in Scotland is final. 
So why are his colleagues in Scotland distributing leaflets that say a vote for the Tories is a vote to stop an independence referendum? If a vote for the British nationalist Tories in Scotland must be accepted as a legitimate vote against a referendum, surely a vote for the SNP in May must be respected as a mandate for putting Scotland's future in Scotland's hands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. I'm delighted to hear a sort of uh, acceptance there that he's running a nationalist uh, party. If that's what he was... Uh, uh, what he was saying, because I'm afraid I agree, I agree with that. They're not in respect of, of the whole of this country. Uh, but I think most people will think it extraordinary uh, that uh, they're talking about another referendum. Uh, the Labour chief whip is nodding quite rightly. Uh, when, uh, when actually what the, what the people of this country want to see is us working together as one united kingdom without further constitutional upheaval to get through the pandemic and build back better. Sarah Brittle. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I firstly just say how great it was to welcome my right honourable friend to Accrington last week, and I'm sure the Prime Minister will join me in thanking both the staff and pupils at Accrington Academy for making our visit such a welcoming one. As you'll know, Mr Speaker, my constituency was at the heart of the first industrial revolution, and we're ready to lead in the new green industrial revolution and level up once and for all. So on that note, will my right honourable friend commit to supporting my campaign to rejuvenate our high streets and town centres across Highland and Haslinden. Mr Speaker, I congratulate my honourable friend on her campaign. Uh, it was great to be in Accrington, and I hope that she'll be hearing uh, even more shortly from my right-hand friend, the Chancellor, about what we can do uh, to support uh, the Towns Fund and other measures to help Accrington and places across the whole country, Mr Speaker. We're now heading up to Amy Callaghan. Oh, no, I do welcome back again. Good to see you. Amy Callaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank um, you and members across the House, including the Prime Minister, for your well wishes during my illness. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister had previously guaranteed there was no threat to the Erasmus scheme as a result of Brexit. We now know that charities such as Stand International in my constituency, who participate in the programme, are set to lose 96% of their funding as a, as a result of the UK Government's decision to pull the plug on Erasmus+. Plus. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that charities will receive match funding under the new Turing scheme? And will he agree to meet with me and representatives from Stand International to ensure no young person in Eastern Bartonshire gets left behind as a result of Brexit? I, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I uh, say how much I welcome uh, the Honourable Lady back to, to PMQs. It's great to, great to see her back, uh, Mr Speaker. And I do, I do give her this assurance that I, do, I think the Turing scheme uh, will be uh, better uh, and it will deliver uh, exactly what uh, she wants, because I think if there was a criticism of the Erasmus schemes, it tended to favour uh, higher income households. We will do everything uh, that we can uh, with the Turing scheme uh, to reach out to uh, give uh, opportunity to people from disadvantaged backgrounds. That is uh, what we intend to do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend has taken a strong personal interest in the tragic story of my constituent, Harry Dunn. So can I ask him, will he please continue to do everything in his power to reassure Tim and Charlotte, Harry's parents and all their family, that he will try to persuade President Biden to deliver justice for Harry? I thank my right honourable friend, and she's completely right to continue to raise the case of uh, Harry Dunn, and, uh, and we sympathise deeply with his family. It's a case that uh, we continue to raise at the highest level, and I know that uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the Foreign Secretary, has only just raised it uh, now with, uh, with Tony Blinken, uh, US Secretary of State. Let's head to Beth Winter. Beth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Rhonda Kennetaf, where my constituency of Cannavale is located, has the third highest COVID death rate in the UK, due mainly to inequality, poverty and chronic underfunding. This UK government has an appalling record on providing Wales with even a fair share of UK spending, let alone the funded needed to level up. 11 years of Tory steady cuts destroyed the capacity of our public services to withstand the pandemic, and now he plans to bypass the democratic structures in Wales. My constituent, Linda, has a question for the Prime Minister. What will it take for him to stop ignoring the South Wales Valleys? 
Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I'm afraid I disagree profoundly with the, uh, with the implication of what she, she is saying and indeed with uh, what her constituent Linda uh, is by implication uh, asking because uh, this government continues to give massive support through uh, the Barnet formula and elsewhere. I think the, uh, through Barnet alone it's £2.4 billion pounds, and there is now more coming, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, through the, uh, the levelling up fund and, and other uh, and other means, and it's thanks to the UK government that the furlough scheme has supported 3,400 jobs in her constituency alone, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that is one of the advantages of the United Kingdom. Let's go to Andrew Bowie. Andrew. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Only this week, the government once again demonstrated its commitment to the energy industry, jobs in the northeast of Scotland as a whole, with uh, over 30 million pounds committed to creating a green energy transition zone and a global underwater hub. But would my right humble friend therefore go further and support this most vital industry, vital to developing the energy technologies of the future, based, he will agree, in the greatest part of the country, transitioning to net zero with a long-awaited energy transition deal which will help transform the oil capital of Europe into the green energy centre of the world. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I really congratulate my honourable friend on his uh, last-minute lobbying. He's only got a few minutes to wait uh, before he may hear something to his advantage. Let's go to Carla Lockhart. Carla. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, in an interview with Sophie Ridge broadcast on the 8th of December 2019, you pledged there would be no checks on goods going from NI to GB or from GB to NI. While this has proven more challenging to deliver in practice, would you wish to take this opportunity to encourage ministers in Northern Ireland to do all oh, they oh, can? Order. Oh, oh, order. Oh, order. Unfortunately, I'm not responsible, and you is not something that we should be using. My, my humble apologies. Uh, can, can you make this an aspiration to reality and to ensure they act in accordance with Section 46 of the United Kingdom Internal Market Act 2020, which stresses the importance of facilitating the free flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Yes, Mr Speaker, I certainly can uh, do that. And as I said uh, in answer to another uh, right honourable gentleman from her uh, party, we leave nothing off the table in order uh, to make sure that we get that done. And there is unfettered access, NIGB and GBNI. Let's head to Andrew Percy. Andrew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister has been a good friend of East Scotia and Northern Lincolnshire, and he will be aware that the Humber is the biggest trading uh, estuary in the country and contains the UK's biggest port. So will I, can I encourage him, therefore, to look at the Humber Freeport bid, bid uh, closely and also favourably as it contains sites in Hull, Goul, Grimsby and the Scunthorpe Steelworks, which are really important for this region to use. Uh, I, I, he's absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend is, is, uh, has mounted an excellent uh, campaign, and uh, the uh, Chancellor, my honourable friend, the Chancellor, will be saying more about that a little shortly. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. HS2 reduces journey times from Manchester Airport to London from two hours twenty-four minutes to fifty-nine minutes. With the carbon capture that we would generate and the increased capacity to the West Coast Main Line. Can I ask the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, what prevents governments from putting shovels in the ground in the north now? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the, the answer to that is, as anybody knows who gets a project done on uh, their home or, whatever, or wherever, if you, if you start again uh, midway through, you, I'm afraid you, you greatly multiply uh, the cost, uh, but we are going to go as fast as we possibly can. Final question, Donna Kruger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The last time the UK hosted the G7 in 2013, the then Prime Minister launched the Social Impact Investment Task Force to catalyse a market for private capital seeking social outcomes as well as financial returns. And this country now leads the world in the development of financial innovations for public good. So will my right honourable friend confirm that the social, impact, uh, social investment tax relief, which was launched after that summit, will continue beyond April? And will he use this year's G7 to trumpet to the world the benefit of social investment, social enterprise and the social economy in general? 
my, my honourable friend has long been a, a campaigner for the wonderful benefits of uh, social enterprise. Uh, I, I visited some of his own, and uh, if he just waits a little bit longer, he'll receive uh, an update on social investment tax relief, Mr Speaker. I'm suspending the House for three minutes to enable the necessary arrangements for the next business to be made. Order.